السلام علیکم خواتین حضرات وسیم ایس اینڈ ویلکمس یو ٹو لیکچر نمبر 27 آف مارکیٹنگ فار نان پرافٹس ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو ایٹ ایٹ دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان دی اوور آل ایریا آف لرننگ اسٹل ریمینس چینل ڈیولپمنٹ بٹ دی ماجول آف لرننگ وچ آئی ایم گن ٹچ اپن رائٹ وے از گوئنگ ٹو بی دی ایریا آف کوآڈینیشن اینڈ کنٹرول دیز آر the factors that have to be looked into with very carefully by the non-profits while they deal with their channel members. And since in many of the cases their channel members are commercial intermediaries, it is incumbent upon the non-profits to try to understand how they operate, how they think, what their values are, and what their priorities are. Unless they understand um, their turf or the business philosophy on their terms, Non-profits will always be at a loss to do business with commercial intermediaries. And like I pointed out, the problem arises because both the parties have different values, different priorities, and different missions. Commercial distributors could have uh, the mission of making profits uh, through the making their programs with highly efficient and effective, whereas non-profit organizations could basically work for their mission, and which is attainment of a particular noble cause. So there is a need to uh, develop a common turf where relationships can be taken to the next level, to a higher level, where both can be satisfied and uh, happy with getting into the relationship that they have gotten into. Let me give you one example of how and why this problem can occur. There is a commercial distributor who is selling so many different products and he's got a very wide scope of distribution. And this is how he attains very high efficiency. Whereas a non-profit may not be in a position to supply to that distributor the product non-profit wants distributed according to the program which the distributor has carved out for himself. Because non-profits basically are not into business, they are at a loss to understand the importance of the efficiency of distribution systems with which commercial intermediaries develop. They have to call on their wholesalers and retailers according to a pre-planned program, which could be like you know, once a week, twice a week, or maybe even more. So whatever the frequency is, when distributors, sales force, go to the market distributing different products for which they happen to be distributors, the product from the non-profit also has to be present there because retailers who are going to sell that product or distribute that product to the ultimate consumers do develop expectations that along with other commercial items the product from the non-profit will also accompany those. Because in the absence of that, they feel embarrassed by not getting complete provisions what they have been expecting or what they have ordered. And therefore, any lapse on part of the non-profit can lead to embarrassment on part of the distributor and also the non-profit itself. And this is where non-profits have got to understand that how commercial distributors operate and there is a dire need on part of the non-profits to understand their turf and the variables which are important to develop and maintain the commercial relationship that they have gotten into with the intermediary because these commercial intermediaries generally complain that non-profit organizations do not really have the savvy meaning the marketing savvy to be able to understand Uh, the pressures under which we operate and the variables which are very important for our success. And therefore, non-profit organizations have to look upon such intermediaries not as just agents or channel members, but rather as target audience. Only when they try to understand and appreciate their existence and their posture as uh, a target audience will they be in a position to understand how they really operate and what it really takes to make them successful. And uh, this really 
takes us back to the point of uh, costs and rewards. Nonprofit organizations have got to understand that uh, commercial intermediaries have certain costs to incur. And once they have incurred those costs, they look for certain benefits. And uh, it is those benefits which nonprofits have got to really appreciate. And therefore, to align themselves or to align their programs with those of the distributors, all such understandings have got to be made uh, practicable for nonprofits to make the whole relationship successful. And therefore, the problem of coordination and control uh, has got to be resolved if it exists and if it really uh, prevents the commercial intermediary from carrying out you know, his programs uh, to the level of efficiency with which he envisages. So this is all for uh, coordination and control. Let us now get on to the next uh, module of learning, which is going to be about occasion strategies. Uh, you will recall that we have learned channel strategies, but along with um, those strategies, we also have to have occasion strategies. I think it is common sensible because we've got a place from where we distribute our uh, products or programs. And uh, that place has got to be made very friendly. And we can make that place very friendly if uh, uh, we create occasions which are memorable, uh, which are uh, easy, and uh, which are uh, consumer friendly. And in order to make uh, those uh, occasions easy, uh, emotional, and uh, rewarding, we have to understand how we can make them easy for our target audience, and what is uh, it that it takes to make them emotional, and how can we reinforce the behaviors of our target audience uh, by rewarding them. So let us take a look at um, all these factors the one by one. But we can make uh, the occasion um, or the behaviors uh, while uh, we undertake um, execution of the program by a couple of different means. The first is we can make the behavior easy in terms of timing. If you happen to be a blood collection the unit, you can uh, make the behavior easy for your target audience by having such hours uh, of collection that do not really clash with the general work hours. And same could be the case with um, training sessions. Okay, you are carrying out training sessions for um, addicts uh, and um, you could want them to uh, be at um, the place of uh, training uh, without fail. So you've got to look at uh, the ease which uh, could be provided to them uh, by way of uh, having uh, flexible hours. And uh, that is how uh, you make occasions easy for the target audience. Uh, you can also have uh, the behaviors uh, fully explained on the website. That also could be one of the means of uh, the making behaviors easy. Another um, way of uh, the making behaviors easy is uh, the by way of uh, creating an easy location. How do you do that? Well, we already have learned that uh, the marketing people from uh, nonprofits go to the target audiences. In certain cases, they are uh, undertaking programs which uh, require that marketing people take a visit to um, those remote areas, uh, target audience from where, they may not undertake the effort to come to them. And uh, I think this goes without saying that we are talking about the very first stage of pre-contemplation. And that is the time when we know that our target audience um, does not really have a clue about the existence of the nonprofit organization or the program that we envisage undertaking. And therefore, we have to go to, to them. And uh, by visiting them, we make uh, the behavior occasion easy for them. Well, the fact of the matter is that uh, it is uh, incumbent upon uh, nonprofit organizations to create such occasions. Otherwise, uh, they may not succeed in execution of their programs and hence attainment of the mission. They can uh, make uh, location easy by placing literature 
about uh, the nonprofit. Let's go back to the area of communications, because we have so many different kinds of communications that we think that the people should uh, take a look at. Not only take a look at, rather they should engage themselves with uh, the communication uh, so that they know who we are, with what we are, what we do, and what we stand for. So you can, as a nonprofit organization, put uh, such literature at public places like uh, the airports, uh, even at bus stands, at uh, supermarkets, at uh, all those places where people go to deposit bills, could be banks, could be any other uh, uh, channel which uh, uh, is supportive of uh, this particular occasion behavior. So there could be uh, so many different uh, areas in which uh, you can uh, make uh, the uh, behavior location easy with the by the way of creating a location with which uh, is close to them. Uh, you can uh, make uh, fundraising possible uh, with the help of telephones. And that also is uh, the one example of uh, creating a location with which is easy. And uh, that is how you create the circumstances and conditions whereby your target audience gets engaged with the cause. The next area which um, is important for nonprofits to understand is that uh, they have to make the occasion uh, very emotional by creating conditions that uh, the target audience emotionally can engage with, with the cause. And they can do that uh, by undertaking so many different kinds of programs. And as a matter of fact, you all are familiar with um, such programs with which nonprofits undertake for this particular purpose. And uh, I would like to take you back to the example of uh, musical concerts or uh, the Mehfil and Milad or uh, Nat competition and so on and so forth. These are uh, the very classic examples of uh, creating uh, occasions where you really can uh, evoke emotional uh, feelings on part of the target audience and engage them with the cause. You can create uh, things like uh, the marathons and uh, walks, and that's what the many nonprofits do nowadays all over the world. Nonprofit organizations have so many different ways to create such occasions whereby they can create uh, emotional bonds, and uh, a couple of more uh, could be um, from the area of uh, the healthcare. A nonprofit is operating in basic healthcare uh, provision, and uh, they are uh, undertaking certain procedures which could be painful. Uh, they can make those procedures less painful by employing um, advanced equipment and materials. Um, if they cannot do that, they can have staff that is very friendly and through their behavior can make that particular occasion less painful or rather easy or less difficult, so to say. Um, under such circumstances, what happens is that the target audience members um, develop a sense of security, uh, protection, and well-being. And this is uh, what could be a very good basis for uh, changing their behaviors. And uh, therefore, they are good catalysts. In order to do that, it is not just the staff members that uh, the nonprofit organization has to have. They also have to create uh, the environment, which is very friendly. The environment is all about looks. And this takes us back to the concept of um, the experiential level of uh, the brand raising process, whereby we already have learned that uh, the good environment, which is uh, full of you know, good things. They have good furniture. They have good uh, colors on the walls. They have uh, posters hung all over the place and they are very attractive, they talk about their mission, their values, and uh, they uh, communicate with the target audience with the help of certain absorbing and engaging stories and so on and so forth. These are the kind of um, environmental uh, factors that uh, develop that particular sense of uh, the well-being and uh, the protection on part of the target audience members who uh, tend to think that they are in good hands and therefore uh, they uh, tend to develop a sense of satisfaction which lead to a change of behavior. 
Another uh, area that, uh, that we need to look into uh, to make uh, behaviors uh, very rewarding is that uh, nonprofit organizations can have got to be very good at expectation management. You may get surprised why I'm talking about expectations. Well, it is for the simple reason that people coming to the nonprofit organizations do come there with a certain level of expectations with which, if not met, will leave them unsatisfied. And unsatisfied people are never going to talk about the service because they go out of the place and the occasion unsatisfied. And therefore, what it really boils down to is that the place and occasion both should create conditions whereby people leave the organization with a very high level of satisfaction because that is going to meet their expectations and once those are met they are going to talk about um, uh, that satisfaction with others and that is where the concept of social social power again comes in because uh, the people talking with more people and then more people in turn uh, bringing more people into the fold is going to be the force multiplier and that's the beauty of this particular concept the place and the occasion because they both have got to be very effective at the same time for people to be satisfied leaving the organization as satisfied uh, donors, uh, clients, uh, volunteers and activists. Any stakeholders they, they may take the form of they have to be satisfied with the ones they are there. It is also very important to keep um, expectations of uh, your target audience a little lower than uh, what you really can offer. And uh, I think you know, this also takes us back to the concept of communications, uh, where we have planned that we are not to overdo our communications, we are not to overcommit ourselves, rather uh, we should be uh, a little lower than uh, what they are expecting or uh, what they will expect after they have gone through the literature or the communications that uh, we have sent their way. Because that way, the ones uh, people have a certain level of expectation with which you are confident is going to be lower than what you really can offer, you in actuality will delight them. And uh, nothing uh, works more than having delighted customers uh, who can be loyal to the cause. And if they are donors, they will repeat that the behavior over and over again. If they are volunteers and activists, they would like to uh, work for the organization over and over again. For not just the program they have uh, enrolled themselves into, they may also get to offer their services for any future program that you may envisage launching. What is it that uh, you need to do in order to uh, keep them motivated? Well, you can uh, get back to the concept of uh, rewarding them. You can um, offer them certificates of acknowledgement. And uh, this again is something that uh, we learned as part of uh, the communications process. And uh, by rewarding people, uh, we make them more and more committed to the cause. And uh, it is obvious uh, that when uh, people get acknowledgements, uh, they get rewarded. And uh, the rewarded people always repeat their behaviors because this is something which uh, uh, behavioral psychologists they do believe in. And uh, the bottom line is to offer rewards to your target audience wherever you can with, with those certificates. And uh, the once you've done that, you can use your target audience to give you testimonials. So it is kind of a two-way process. And uh, once you know, they start giving testimonials, you fulfill one of the fundamentals of the good communications, whereby you create that connection between your the target audience. Remember the example of your own university, because it's somebody who already has graduated talking about the goodness of the programs offered by the virtual university and uh, the level of uh, placement which uh, they get or they have gotten uh, as a result of uh, the degree uh, which the university offered. So this is how uh, you use uh, testimonials and uh, rewarded customers are uh, satisfied customers and rewarded customers are the ones who would uh, repeat their behaviors over and over again.
you may think of the example that I just cited, uh, how uh, would a student who already has uh, graduated from the university will get into a repeat behavior. Well, the fact is that I'm going to talk about that uh, in one of the following components, and that will make a lot of sense why it is important to maintain contact with uh, those who already have been through the program to which the organization is offering. That could be an education program, could be a health program. You see these uh, cancer survivors from Shaukat Khanum talking about uh, the uh, regaining of the health and the whole uh, recuperation or the recovery process that they have gone through. And uh, that really um, gives a lot of strength to those to the patients who already are in the process of treatment, so on and so forth. So there are so many different ways that uh, the marketing people can um, create um, conditions for uh, rewarding their uh, target audiences who in turn will work for the cause. With this, we now get on to the next component, which is on pricing. Pricing, as we all know, is a very important variable of the marketing mix concept. And without pricing, there is no organization with which really can complete the whole strategic marketing process. I think it goes without saying. How do nonprofit organizations undertake the concept of pricing when they sell their products? Because the fact is, there are many products which are not sold, and there are products which are sold, but are sold at a price which is less than what it otherwise would have been if it was offered on a commercial basis, or maybe it would have been uh, less expensive if it was sold on a commercial basis. And this is a very interesting phenomenon, and I'm going to talk about that, why a product um, sold through a commercial setup uh, could be less expensive than uh, its counterpart uh, offered by nonprofit organizations. Because of the fact that uh, the concept of pricing takes into its fold two important components. But the one is uh, that of social costs and the other is that of business costs. When we talk about uh, commercial entities or commercial products, could we take into consideration just business costs? And could we all are uh, familiar with the concept of uh, overall costing. But we have so many different kinds of costs. Some are marginal costs and some are fixed costs. And uh, we know what marginal costs are. You know, you know we have uh, to pay for raw materials, for salaries, for overheads, and so on and so forth. There are so many different uh, the portions to that particular component, which is known as the, uh, or we may call as uh, the business costs in the context of nonprofits, because we are trying to differentiate between business costs and social costs. What are social costs? Well, they basically are uh, all those uh, extraordinary or uh, the untraditional costs that commercial organizations may not have to undertake because they are working on a regular basis, um, churning out uh, production um, on a repetitive basis, on a very uniform um, lines, day in and day out. That may not be the case with nonprofits. They deal with uh, newer situations every time. And uh, the programs are not the ones which uh, are repeated over and over again, unless it happens to be a hospital. But in many cases, they have to incur social costs. For example, they have to train people, um, volunteers and activists, because they would like them to be fully educated on the program and its mechanics before they go out in the marketplace and start um, rendering their service. So before they could perform their desired behavior, uh, they've got to be taken into complete confidence and uh, uh, are uh, to be educated about uh, the different dimensions of the program of which they're going to be a part of. Uh, social costs, therefore, are extra costs. And uh, the question here is, uh, how do nonprofits manage to take into the pricing model uh, social costs as well as business costs? Uh, because uh, not all the time, 
uh, non-profit organizations are in a position to recover all the costs. They can recover a certain portion of the cost that they have incurred, and the remaining portion, of course, is funded by somebody else. And that is exactly where donors come in, where they fit in. That is why we need donations. And uh, the concept or the role of uh, the donors uh, to gain um, real importance when we talk about the pricing factor. There are uh, consumers or customers who may be willing to uh, offer you a price which uh, may cover uh, both your costs, meaning social costs as well as business costs, but that generally is not the case. And uh, there are uh, clients who are not willing to pay uh, what it really has cost you uh, for the simple reason they know that you happen to be a non-profit organization uh, working for a noble cause and their expectation of paying at your facility is at a low level, meaning they expect a lower cost. So how do they operate? This really is a challenge for the nonprofit organizations. Challenge in the sense that because if they try to recover all the costs, they have to go for a price which is higher, meaning which is higher than what it could have been or would have been um, if it was sold by the commercial sector. And they may not like to do that because the people or the clients would feel kind of demotivated and they will shy away from the program and they may not offer you the full potential of reachability and connectability. So therefore, you've got to be very careful about how you price the product. Conversely, if a nonprofit organization offers a price which is lower than the total cost, it cannot sustain itself. It suffers losses and uh, it has to cover those losses. It is easy to say that uh, the donors will come to the aid of the nonprofit and cover that portion, but it takes a lot to uh, work toward that end. Needless to say that the nonprofits are all about generating funds through that way also, but why make the job of uh, the nonprofit marketing people unduly difficult or more difficult. We have to see to it that we are in a position to sustain our organizations and that we can sustain our organizations by charging a price which covers our costs to the maximum possible extent. As a matter of fact, nonprofit organizations have got to maintain a balance between uh, what they really can forego as part of the cost and what they're going to charge their target audience in order to come up with a package which is reasonable. And this is where the concept of the hybrid model of pricing comes in. Most of the nonprofit organizations, the fact of life is, do not charge a price which totally covers their social costs as well as business costs. And they have to have the support of uh, the donors who uh, will cover um, certain portions or total portions of the social cost, whereas their customers would like to weigh their product or their program in typical to the business terms by looking at those features which they think should cost just about so much. And they do not take into account what it really has cost you to come up to that level to have been able to develop that particular product or program which has reached the level where you are offering at a place where they happen to be and the occasion that you have created to make it very successful, they only look at the business side of it and do some working in their minds, um, arriving at a figure which of course is definitely less than what it generally costs the organization. So. Again and again, the question arises of uh, the covering that portion of costs with which happens to be the social costs. Now, this is not to say that uh, you are extremely mechanical in terms of talking with your donors that the falling happens to be the social portion of costs and the falling happens to be the business portion of costs it's because donors generally do not really go into uh, those details as long as they're convinced that uh, the, your program really has a social impact. And uh, once convinced of the social impact, they always could, would like to donate toward the cause. But the uh, 
challenge uh, here uh, is that uh, you have to cover both the costs. And um, the implication, therefore, is that uh, the nonprofit organizations could have to think of the pricing model in terms of uh, social lines and business lines, okay, because okay, both are very important variables of the pricing model. And it is on the basis of these two particular components that nonprofit organizations come up with their pricing. Another challenge that um, they really they run into is the opposite of okay, what I talked about, the social impact and the perception of the social impact on part of the donors. There could be certain donors who may not be as convinced as others about the social impact of your program. And they, they may question uh, about uh, the level of uh, giving that they have to make uh, on their part. And therefore, you've got to be prepared about uh, the, all the factors of your costs so that you can talk with them about uh, the, all the variables that are responsible uh, for the makeup of the cost factors. Do not forget that uh, you have stakeholders, uh, and in particular, the many donors who also happen to be the business people. The fact is, in most of the cases, they are business people, and business people being very commercial in their approach, uh, they may like to ask you questions uh, about uh, such um, pricing decisions, uh, not for uh, the reason of uh, the checking your integrity, but just for their own sake, for their interest, so that uh, they can make up their mind as to what would be the realistic level of the endowment or the donation which they should make toward the cause. Now, having known all this and having considered the two uh, components of uh, the cost factor, i.e. the social cost and the business cost, we are now all set to go ahead with the pricing model. But it is not that easy again. Before we go ahead with the uh, preparation of the model, there are uh, a couple of um, strategic considerations that we have to undertake. And those are, what really are the objectives of pricing? I mean, the nonprofit organization, they just cannot go for a price because they think it is a very reasonable price. Or they cannot uh, determine the price because they think it is good enough in order to be able to uh, recover the most of their costs, leaving them less room for donations and less hard work for collecting those donations. It is uh, a generalized form of uh, the making a statement toward that pricing model, but that's not the way the pricing model works. We've got to be extremely uh, careful and very clear about our objectives. And uh, the other objectives could, could be, uh, for example, maximization of profits and uh, we all know there is nothing wrong with uh, maximizing profitability when you are working for a non-profit organization as long as uh, you are ethical and uh, you're not crossing the boundaries of those ethical limits. You need to have profits to have a very high level of reserves in order to invest into future programs or in order to carry your um, existing program uh, through all the phases toward implementation of it. And uh, the other objective could be that uh, you would want to recover your costs. Uh, to what extent you should recover your costs, we, we're going to talk about that. And uh, the third objective could be that uh, you want to increase the usage of uh, the product that you are selling or distributing. You are always wanting to increase the usage of the program because you want to bring in more and more people into the fold of that program. May that program be about smoking, meaning an anti-smoking campaign. May that be about improving the environment or may that be undertaking of rehabilitation process carried out on addicts, meaning druggies. So whatever program you are undertaking, you would like more and more people um, walking into it so that you can have a great level of social impact. So the objectives are, number one, you may like to maximize profits. Number two, you may like to increase the usage of the product. Number three, 
you may like to have the objective of cost recovery. And once you are clear about these objectives, you then are in a position to go ahead with the pricing strategies. But before I start talking about the strategies, let's talk about the objective of profit maximization. I think we're all convinced that there is nothing wrong with making profits. And a not-for-profit organization does not uh, really bar itself from making profits. We have to have profits in order to survive. The only thing is that we do not take those profits home. Those profits stay back into the kitty of the organization for future things. And let me give you a good one example of um, a few programs or occasions that uh, we may undertake as nonprofits. Because we conduct things like uh, the Mafale Milad, not competition, uh, musical concerts, and these are the examples which are the stereotypes of so many different kinds of nonprofit programs. But the concept here is that of pricing. We charge a price to the target audience that's coming there um, at a level which may sound a little higher or which, which may feel a little higher. If it was conducted by a commercial organizer, the price he would have charged it would have been lesser than what we are charging. This is a fact that we know, and this is a fact that the target audience also knows, but they do pay. Why? Because they know that the money is going to go toward a very noble cause, and that is where the opportunity is to make good of that. And this is a very convincing manifestation of the phenomenon of the profit maximization. You may have a question kind of flashing into your minds here that this is kind of a, a short-term thing or this is kind of a thing that which is sporadic. You know, that this is not something which will take place consistently. This happens once in a while, like the once in a quarter, once in, you know, in, in six months. But whatever the case may be, we have to keep in mind that this is an opportunity uh, available to nonprofits okay, the, who can organize such events that provide them with the opportunity of okay, the maximizing profits, although for the once in a while. You may have this question flashing into your minds that this is kind of a one-time thing and uh, this is not something that happens on a consistent basis. Um, it happens the once in a while. So because of the sporadic uh, existence of uh, such programs, our undertaking of such programs, we cannot really count on them, but the fact is that everything adds up. And we've got to look for opportunities that will provide us with this kind of a platform which uh, will be uh, contributing toward that profitability that I'm talking about. Uh, to then talking about the uh, consistent basis, let me give you the example of uh, a university that uh, may charge uh, its students a uh, very high uh, tuition fee because uh, it is offering a very uh, specialized level of courses or uh, it is offering courses in areas which are highly specialized and uh, they are extremely research oriented. They uh, happen to involve uh, uh, a, a, a set of faculty uh, which is not uh, easy to put together and therefore the university uh, may decide to maximize its profits in order to recover its costs to the extent possible. And uh, this is uh, where they like to uh, get into the pricing model uh, by envisaging a certain level of response because this is where the demand level has got to be ascertained as realistically as possible to see what kind of a price level is going to be practicable charging for that particular service. And in this case, we are talking about a university offering some high level courses in specialized areas. So what is important here is to see what will be the level of demand. If we offer price X, the falling uh, number of students may enroll. If we offer price Y, um, falling number of students will attend the course. Whatever is the case, we can work with different numbers at different demand levels in order to come up with uh, the A price which we think is uh, or could be uh, practicable. And this is uh, the example that uh, fits very well into a nonprofit uh, context. Um, 
in the area of education. The other objective is um, cost recovery. And let me talk about cost recovery before I start talking about uh, the maximizing usage of the product. Cost recovery is extremely important because okay, without covering our costs, of course, you know, we are not going to sustain ourselves. And like I said earlier, okay, it is here that we have to decide you know, what portion of the cost is uh, going to be borne you know, by donors and uh, what is the remainder okay, that is going to be borne by the organization itself. The level of donation is something which is to be determined by looking into the history of that particular program or by looking into the history of the organization. And we know the kind of donations that come our way on a consistent basis or you can say from time to time. And we have a history of donors who have been um, donating toward uh, our cause and uh, we know the strength of those donations and we know the level that is required to offset the costs that we are going to incur as a total of social costs and business costs. And therefore, this objective really necessitates that the organizations look into the, look into the extent of the donations to which they are expecting and the extent of the recovery which they expect at a certain level of price. Here again, you work with the level of response to which you expect, level of response in relation to demand, and uh, work out your prices. But what is important here to see is to what extent you really can recover your social costs and your business cost portion. Well, you have to be sure about one thing while you have uh, the cost recovery objective that uh, you as a nonprofit must be in a position to recover at least your operating costs. This is the bottom line here that uh, you should not go lower than the recovery of your uh, the operating costs because the remaining costs could be recovered with the help of donations. So uh, if you work out that uh, more than 50% of total costs are going to be um, covered through donations and uh, less are going to be covered through the actual the pricing of the product, so be it. You have to work more on uh, uh, donations and uh, run after donors in order to make sure that uh, you really can sustain yourselves. Organizations at times do recover costs to the extent that uh, they are safe on account of both social costs and business costs. This is a fact of life. Now, if you have a program which really allows you to do that, you are most welcome to do that. But if you think it is not going to be practicable and people or other target audience are going to be demotivated with the kind of pricing level that you're going to offer, then you may reconsider that. And the reason organizations with those kind of programs, which could be very promising and which are very specialized in nature and which offer them the potential to recover all the costs uh, through uh, the pricing model are the ones who are also skeptical about uh, donations from their donors. They always uh, doubt that uh, they're going to generate funds from donors um, to recover their social costs and uh, therefore uh, they go for a pricing model uh, given the nature of their program as well, which enables them to recover all costs. The next one uh, is about uh, the market size maximization. I think uh, that this is a concept which takes us back to the commercial marketing activity. And we all know that uh, everybody in this world uh, likes to uh, increase their uh, market share. And they increase their uh, market share uh, by increasing the usage of their particular product. And same really applies in the area of nonprofits okay, who would like to have more and more people coming to join their program. And uh, when that happens, they can uh, uh, recover uh, the costs uh, by having uh, a larger uh, size of the market. And uh, there are uh, the two different options which uh, nonprofits uh, mostly uh, have at their, at their disposal uh, when they 
envisage their uh, pricing objectives. The one is that uh, they offer the programs or their product for that matter at um, zero price. The other option is they offer a very low price. Now, these two options, the meaning zero price and low price, are the ones which nonprofits think okay, will let them increase the size of the market exponentially. When they charge no price at all, the people will throng and they would like to enroll themselves as part of the program or they would like to buy the product which they are offering absolutely free of cost. By the same token, they also believe that a low price will also maximize their the market. Now, the option of zero price is not a good option. The history of uh, nonprofit marketing shows that uh, zero price in most of the cases rather always has turned out to be a negative force because the people think of that particular product being offered with no price at all as devoid of quality. They think it is a low quality product and that is why the organization is not charging any price. And the fact is this has been um, a case in point in the Indian market where Nonprofit organizations um, distributed ORS through commercial distributors at zero price. And the fact is, uh, the usage was not increased because uh, the target audience thought that the product was not good. And uh, commercial intermediaries thought that they did not really have any commercial interest because they were not getting any commissions out of for that uh, uh, supply chain uh, the mechanism. There was no price and therefore no commissions and therefore no interest on part of the commercial channel members. So we have to keep in mind to what extent we can be benevolent or be flexible with the pricing factor. If we think that by offering something at zero price, we can increase the market, the evidence of this philosophy in the not working is right before us. So, in other words, we've got to create conditions whereby not only the target market looks upon the program or the product as something of very good quality, but also commercial intermediaries also stay engaged because they know they have a commercial stake in it. Without that commercial stake, they will never make the program successful. And I think you know, that uh, takes us uh, back to the concept that I just talked about a few minutes ago, uh, that um, nonprofit organizations have got to understand the mentality and priorities and values and objectives and goals of commercial intermediaries as their channel partners. Only then will they be in a position to make their programs successful. And I think this Indian example is a the very classic example that really fits into that particular concept, whereby commercial people complain of nonprofit organizations not having the marketing savvy to be able to make their products successful. Coming to a low price, that is something that might work in the marketplace because people they may have a very positive uh, uh, view of that uh, the particular marketing objective or strategy for that matter on part of the nonprofit organization. Therefore, we can say with a lot of confidence that the pricing model, uh, given this particular objective of uh, maximizing uh, usage of the product, has to be worked out on the basis of making sure that your product does carry an appeal for the target market, and at the same time, it is attractive for those members of the channels who are going to make the whole uh, program successful toward implementation and uh, you pick the right price by considering these particular considerations. So in turn, we can say that we have to have a pricing model which stimulates demand and it increases revenues. So I think you know, at the end of the day, it sounds real hard business. You have to be able to generate a level of demand or a level of response which really enables you to increase the market size. And uh, before you increase the market size, you've got to give the whole um, concept a, a very serious consideration as to what really is going to be your objective 
And once you have started working with that objective, what should really be the price level? And the considerations that I've talked about are right in front of you. And I don't really think that we as nonprofit marketing managers that should have any problem coming up with the right price or at least um, giving advice, the right advice to our peers and they're sitting in the, the finance department as to what could be uh, just about um, an appropriate price level uh, to engage the target audience and to make our program successful. So just in order to give you a summary of these uh, three considerations or these three strategic objectives, uh, which must be the basis of uh, going ahead with the pricing model or for that matter, pricing strategies. Let me say that once again, the one is uh, maximization of profits and the other is uh, recovery of cost. And the third one is maximizing the usage of the product so that you can increase the market. So whatever program that you are into, whatever nonprofit you're working for, you've got to have these three considerations and then um, decide for yourselves which one is the most appropriate under your circumstances, meaning which one of the objectives is just about the right one which you should follow or rather you must follow. Because on the basis of that particular objective, you have to come up with strategies. And let me say here, um, in addition to what I've said, that uh, it is a very strategic process and uh, the pricing strategy has got to have a certain solid rationale and that rationale is the objectives that I've just talked about.